Hello everyone. My name is Morgan Zabo. I am the Community Heat and Health Program Manager with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Climate Program Office. And today I'm going to be talking to you about extreme heat, but more specifically going to be talking to you about a program that we have where we are mapping heat islands in cities. So to start off with some context about extreme heat. So over the past 14 consecutive months, we have seen extreme heat across the globe from June 2023 to July 2024 have set global temperature records, breaking uh, previous temperature records from May 2015 through May 2016. And just this past July, on July 22, 2024, we saw the hottest day globally ever recorded. And this extreme heat means a lot for our different communities, which I'll get to on the next slide. So what does extreme heat mean? How is it impacting us? How is it impacting our economy and our infrastructure? On this slide, you can see just a few of the different news articles that we've seen over the past years of the way that extreme heat is impacting our world. We're seeing that extreme heat is impacting our national parks as people who are hiking and people who are experiencing the different parks are experiencing extreme heat illnesses and even deaths. Extreme heat is impacting our economy and our workers, that our workforce is having to change. Workers are having to change the amount of hours that they're working, the times during the day, and it's impacting things like our agriculture and our crop yields. We're also seeing extreme heat impact our infrastructure um, through different blackouts and brownouts as a result of increased air conditioning use uh, and power use that's causing blackouts across the country. And additionally, we've also seen how extreme heat is impacting our school systems with older infrastructure um, and schools not having air conditioning and schools having to then go to online learning. So this is just a quick snapshot of the ways that extreme heat is impacting us. But more specifically, let's talk about how extreme heat is impacting our health. So extreme heat is the number one weather-related killer among Americans, and we refer to it as a silent killer because we don't see the impacts as clearly as we do a tornado or a hurricane. It can happen more delayed over time. And on the right hand uh, slide, you can be able to see the difference of extreme heat deaths versus other, other uh, weather related impacts such as tornadoes and hurricanes. And you can clearly see that heat has the most fatalities among those other impacts. And the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention averages that more than 1,220 people die each year from extreme heat. And we know that is an undercount as some hospitals don't necessarily count some of the heat related deaths that come in. Say if a person comes in from experiencing heat illness, but it's recorded as a cardiovascular issue or a kidney issue. So we know that these numbers are undercounted. And additionally, I want to point out that heat is also impacting our mental health, which some people might not necessarily think about that we're seeing increases in emergency department visits as a result of mental health. We're seeing increases uh, for people with Alzheimer's um, and heat is also impacting our sleep um, with that we're really seeing that as temperatures are continuing to stay above 80 degrees Fahrenheit throughout the night, that it can impact the number of hours of sleep that we get each night. So this is just a quick snapshot of the way that heat is impacting our health and meaning that it's so important that we be addressing this issue. So you might be asking yourself, why is it difficult to be addressing these impacts? So there's a couple different categories that we, we really focus on when thinking about heat. So as I mentioned, it's, we refer to it as the silent killer. Uh, so some of these impacts might be invisible. They might be delayed. We're not seeing things right away. So that can also make it harder to be addressing things. Additionally, a lot of communities don't necessarily know what to do when it comes to extreme heat. They may not have heat action plans. They may not have heat as part of their plans. And so we're struggling to figure out what to do when it comes time for a heat related event. Additionally, there's not always policies and governance, and that includes not just the United States, but across the globe as well. So at the state, local, tribal, territorial, and even federal government level, we're struggling to see some of those policies that are in place for extreme heat. And finally, a lot of communities wait until it's too late to be addressing heat. So you might be wondering what your federal government is doing to be addressing this. So for many years, many federal agencies worked separate on different components of extreme heat. To but to provide a federal coordinated response to this, NOAA and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention launched the National Integrated Heat Health Information System in 2015 to provide this federal coordinated response on extreme heat. 
And since then, we've been working with more than 25 federal agencies that you can see on the bottom of this screen and continuing to grow. As many of these agencies are addressing with, with the energy sector, with our veterans, workers, energy, and so much more, all of us working together to provide this response. And we're working across multiple timescales. So we're not just thinking about how heat is impacting us right now. We're also thinking about how we can be protecting populations now and in the future on all the different scales. And there's a lot of different projects that we've undertaken since 2015 with pilot projects, uh, with different federal funding sources, providing resource documents and guides. Uh, but there's one particular program that I'm gonna be focusing on today, which is our Urban Heat Island Mapping Campaign Program. So the urban heat island effect is the fact that cities are typically much warmer than our nearby rural, more vegetated areas due to factors of the built environment. So on this slide, you can, you can start to see how some of these factors of cities are really impacting that. So notice the taller buildings. Notice the black rooftops, the concrete, the asphalt, uh, the cars that are emitting, are, uh, emitting raced heat. All of these factors together are bringing our heat together in our cities and radiating back out, which is causing our cities to be warmer. On the bottom of the slide, you can see a thermal image of a tree, uh, and that, ra uh, that rating is getting 84 degrees Fahrenheit. And just next to it is an unshaded basketball court, which is reading 125 degrees Fahrenheit. That's really emphasizing how different factors, again, of our built environment are impacting how we are experiencing heat. Additionally, not everyone experiences heat the same. We know that there are many populations, disproportionately impacted populations, that are experiencing heat. And a big factor of that, as you can see on the bottom right-hand slide from New York City, is also people who are living in formerly redlined areas. So this is a historical uh, racist practice in which many communities, especially low-income minority communities, did not receive the same investments as wealthy, affluent white communities. And so we're seeing, especially through our mapping campaign program, that many communities that are still in those areas are experiencing hotter temperatures as they typically have less tree canopy. They have more concrete concrete and asphalt. And so addressing the urban heat island effect is so important, especially since more than 80% of Americans live in cities. So this is something that our program is looking to address. So since 2017, NOAA, the National Integrated Heat Health Information System, partnered with Kappa Strategies, a private sector company out of Portland, Oregon, to do just that, to map the urban heat islands of cities across the country as well as internationally. And there's a lot of different ways that people have mapped urban heat islands in the past. Uh, many have used satellite imagery, many have used land surface temperature, but our program's a little bit different. One of the big things is that we're really looking at air temperature and humidity data, which gives us a better perception of how we as humans feel and experience heat. But the biggest part of our program that makes us different is that we are a community science program. So this is getting volunteers from across the country uh, within their communities to participate in this program where they are not just collecting data and learning about the science of this, but they're also learning about extreme heat and health, which can only help us mobilize as we're moving towards solutions. Um, and you can see some of the, the images up here of volunteers um, that with the data collection then moving to the report stage that outlines where hottest neighborhoods are, which can then lead to solutions. So this is an application-based process. So each year in the fall, uh, we'll put out an application for communities to apply to our program. And we try to make this application as labor, as, as easy as possible, uh, because we know that many communities may not necessarily have the staff uh, to be able to put together a, a big government grant. And so with this easy application process, there's a few questions that we ask communities who are interested in participating. One is, what are the goals of your project? What are you really hoping to get out of, of doing this mapping? Um, we also ask about the volunteer recruitment, um, because as I mentioned, this program could not be done without the wonderful volunteers at the community level. And we really wanna make sure that the volunteers who are part of this program are representative of the community. So not just university students, but people from all over who live in that area who really wanna participate in this study. 
Um, and we really want to make sure that there's a strong, robust network of organizations that are participating in these campaigns too. So it doesn't necessarily have to just be led by academic researchers, but we also want to see participation with community-based organizations, with the local, state, tribal, territorial governments as well, um, and so many different people that can participate. Um, I also want to note that we have a huge environmental justice focus with this program as well as our Urban Heat Island campaign program is under the Biden administration's Justice 40 initiative, which means that more than 40% of the investments and funding from this program goes to communities deemed environmental justice by the White House. And it is one of the questions we ask because we do want to make sure that communities are aware of the different factors in their communities that are contributing to heat differences across the cities. So how does this program work? So what happens is, is that this program takes place just over one day in a community. So I do want to note it is a snapshot of the urban heat island. This is not something that is necessarily long-term monitoring, but just one day. So volunteers will go out on this one day, which is typically one of the hottest days of the summer, and they will attach a temperature sensor to their vehicles, which you can see up here. Uh, and this sensor is collecting air temperature, it's collecting humidity data, as well as GPS location data each second. So the volunteers will drive around these predetermined routes across the city in the morning, the afternoon, and evening. And then they will return the sensors to Kappa Strategies, where they will run all of this data through a machine learning model and then produce a report. So this is what the traverses look like from our reports. So you can see where the different volunteers were driving throughout the day. And then this is what helps us put together our larger report, really outlining the heat distribution across the cities. Another really unique thing about this program is that this is all open science. So anyone is able to get the, the raw data files as well as access the reports from these campaigns because we wanna make sure that everyone has access to this information, that it can be pulled in to different data sources at different levels, whether you're a researcher, whether you are an interested citizen, whether you are with, again, a local government who really can help use this data for different information. Um, and we've been working with different line offices across NOAA to be able to be able to really bring this to the public and could not do this without their support. And so training. So training is a really big part of this program and training happens at a lot of different levels. So when communities are selected for the Urban Heat Island mapping program, we start working with them in the early spring. And so we start training the, the lead organizers right away about the different aspects that they need to think about for their campaigns. Uh, or lead organizers can put in anywhere from 25 to 40 hours a week. So it is something that is intensive uh, because it is a, a massive event to pull off. This is something that is providing a large public service for the community and a lot of times involving many different people and organizations. Uh, so we at the, at the government level as well as Kappa Strategies train the lead organizers and then the lead organizers will go and train the volunteers. So volunteer training typically happens a few weeks before the actual campaign and and the lead organizers will work with them to explain how the sensors work, how to make sure everything is charged, how to attach it to the vehicle, uh, how the different traverses work when driving around. So it's a really great way, again, to educate people about different aspects of data collection and science, but also extreme heat as well, because as volunteers are driving around, they're really able to start to put together how different parts of their neighborhood are contributing to extreme heat. Another big partner that we work with on these campaigns is the National Weather Service. So the National Weather Service, we will put them in touch with the different communities and the weather forecast offices within those communities will get in contact with the lead organizers and help them pin down what exactly their campaign date is gonna be. So at first they'll look at some of the previous forecast information and, and previous climate data to really understand what about the best month is for this campaign. Because again, it just happens over the course of one day. Uh, as we get a little bit closer to that campaign day, we'll start to look at some of the better forecast information and be able to pin down what is the best day. So the best day is typically in the 90th percentile of that community's temperatures. Uh, so really trying to make sure it's one of the hottest days of the year. And we also wanna make sure that there's no chance of precipitation or cloud coverage because that can impact the data. 
And we cannot do that. With, we cannot do this without the help of the Weather Forecast Office because this is so important. Um, not all the campaigns run exactly on the day that they're planned. There's been many campaigns that have had to change based on the weather, but I think that also goes to really show the strength of this program and the lead organizers and the volunteers that everyone is really able to make this shift and, and be flexible as needed. So there's a lot of learning that happens during these campaigns, as I mentioned, not just the, the data collection, the science, but also learning about heat and health in these communities. And so I've been showing a lot of really great images of so many of our volunteers, lead organizers over the years, um, and as mentioning, we cannot do it without them. Um, but one of the big things, too, is that by having this group of people who are participating in these campaigns means that you have, that the communities have this group of people that will help them get to the next step of when it's time to start implementing solutions. This is a, a group of people who are passionate about addressing this in their community. So it's a really great educational campaign in these communities. And this is just a slide to show the amazing volunteers that we've had over the years. As I mentioned, we've been doing this program since 2017 and have had thousands of volunteers in the United States as well as internationally participate in these campaigns. And it's not you know, one type of person who participates. We've seen young people, we've seen up to retire people who are just interested in getting back into it. Of course, there's university students, there's K through 12 students. We've, we've seen a whole different array and as someone who works on this at, at the federal level, it's so great to be able to talk to communities, to go into communities when they're doing this work and really hear from the volunteers about what this means to them, what it means to their community, and how excited they are to really be participating in this type of science. So I wanted to provide a quick snapshot of some of the numbers. Um, I will note, we just wrapped up the 2024 Urban Heat Island campaign program, so we don't have all of that information ready just yet, uh, but we will be holding a public webinar in the early spring to be talking about the results from this previous years. Uh, but for 2024, uh, this is kind of the snapshot we had. So we had over 1.4 million measurements taken in 19 communities with over 900 volunteers, which was our largest number of volunteers uh, during the year. So it's also just been so great to see this program grow, not just in the number of communities we've been able to map, but also the number of volunteers we've had too. There's been some campaigns that have had more than 400 or 500 volunteers sign up to be a part of it. Uh, so it's, it's just been really great to see the investment and the excitement in these communities. So we've been doing this program since 2017, and we've started international mapping just in 2023. Uh, so we've done more than 80 communities in the United States, and in 2023, we started mapping in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, as well as, well as Freetown, Sierra Leone. And just this past year, uh, in January of 2024, we also did mapping in Santiago, Chile, and our upcoming international campaigns will be in Nairobi, Kenya, in uh, Dhaka, Bangladesh, as well as Salvador, Brazil. And this past summer of 2024, we also did some mapping in Mexico as well. So I wanna spend a couple of minutes going into a little bit of a deep dive on how these map works, what do, what do the reports show, um, and doing a deep dive on a few different communities. So I first wanna start with Atlanta, Georgia, selfishly picking Atlanta, cause that is my hometown. Uh, but we did map Atlanta back in 2021 and we found that there was a 14.5 temperature difference across the city. So what that means is there was a 14.5 temperature difference between the hottest and the coolest neighborhoods in the city. And on this slide, you can see the temperature, the, the maps in the collected from data that was taken in the morning, the afternoon and the evening. And so the darker red areas indicate the warmer areas where the blue areas indicate the cooler areas. So it's not necessarily saying that those areas were, were much, much cooler, but just really to indicate the, uh, the temperature difference across the city. And some of the initial temperature findings and initial observations taken from Atlanta were some of the hottest areas were found to be areas that had a lot of industry space with a lot of asphalt and concrete, as well as areas that were densely developed with no tree canopy. Now this is juxtaposed to areas that had a lot of lush tree canopy, which were definitely found to be the cooler areas of the city. 
Uh, next up is Chicago, Illinois, which we mapped just last summer in 2023. And there's definitely a couple things I want to point out, but one of the biggest being that they had one of our largest temperature differences that we've seen thus far of 22 degrees Fahrenheit. And again, that means that there was a 22 degree Fahrenheit difference between the warmest and the coolest neighborhood within the city. This is especially important to note because if you, you, as you may remember, back in 1995, Chicago experienced an extremely deadly heat wave that killed more, that killed hundreds of people across the city. And a lot of these deaths happened in the low income minority neighborhoods with people who did not have access to air conditioning or maybe weren't able to open up their windows. So having this type of data and maps really helps uh, different decision makers be able to realize where they need to be helping their citizens when heat events happen, but also how the cities can work to be implementing heat solutions and make sure that their citizens are staying cool. So some of the observations that we saw in Chicago where there were a lot of densely populated neighborhoods without tree canopy that were in some of the hottest places, um, as well a lot of industrial spaces that were, uh, again, a lot of concrete and asphalt, but a lot of that heat that was happening in those industrial areas were also spilling into nearby neighborhoods too, making them even hotter. Um, again, to, but on the flip side, we also saw with some of the cooler neighborhoods, um, especially that you're able to see um, on the right hand side of the afternoon and evening maps, that those areas that are more towards Lake Michigan and in the green, green spaces and parks uh, were much cooler and they served as almost a buffer to some of the neighboring areas kind of along that area. So that, that part of the city was much cooler. And also want to show a map from one of our international cities. So this is from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, which we mapped in January of 2023. So in Brazil, they found a 12 degree difference between the warmest and the coolest neighborhoods. And an important thing to note for not just, not just on Chicago, but also Rio as well, is that in the evening, the temperatures aren't getting cooler. They're still staying above 80 degrees. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, when we're not, when our bodies aren't able to cool off at night, that's really impacting our sleep. It's impacting so many things about our health. So having that information too about how, if cities are able to cool off in the evening is so important to have. Um, some additional observations from Rio de Janeiro too is that there was again, a lot of densely populated neighborhoods that did not have tree canopy that were among some of the hottest areas. And a very interesting finding was even some of the higher elevation areas that were more towards surrounding forests also were still extremely hot, which was very surprising to the city. So it's something that the city is very interested in addressing and we're really excited to see what some of the outcomes are over the next couple of years. So what are the outcomes of this heat mapping? Since 2017, we've seen a lot of different outcomes from communities, and it's really important to note that it's not a one-size-fits-all solution for communities to be addressing their urban heat island impact. We know that communities have a variety of different issues to address. They have a variety of different populations. And so after the mapping occurs and the cities get back the reports like the ones you just saw, we continue to work with them to understand what are the different type of solutions they are interested in implementing in their communities. So one of the big ones being tree planting, of course, um, and this the reports are really, really useful when communities are thinking about how they want to be addressing tree implanting in their communities because they know that it's probably more useful to be adding these trees to areas that are in the hottest neighborhoods. Many of our communities have been able to take advantage of the Inflation Reduction Act tree canopy grants to the U.S. Forest Service and have been granted millions of dollars to be able to add trees to their communities. We've also seen a lot of data sets being built from, from our uh, heat data, uh, including building heat vulnerability indexes, adding it to their different social vulnerability indexes, um, a heat equity mapper, which I'll get to in a little bit. As well, many communities have been able to add this heat data to climate action plans, to sustainability plans, as well as building their own specific heat action plan, which we've been really great to be able to see how many communities have plans that are specifically addressing extreme heat. We've also seen a lot of different innovations from communities too. So for example, we mapped Las Vegas, Nevada back in 2022, and their mapping results show that a lot of the bus stops were in the hottest neighborhoods of the city. 
And so they were able to use their data to quickly get a grant from the federal government to add shading structures over the bus stops to be able to give bus riders relief while waiting for the bus. Additionally, Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina, which we mapped back in 2021, saw that they had a lot of concrete and asphalt in the city that was contributing to higher temperatures. So the city of Raleigh was able to work with their city government uh, their, and, and city council to be able to get a grant to be able to paint titanium dioxide onto, uh, onto the sidewalks to be able to just help with relief from this extreme heat. So like I said, there's a lot of different ways that communities have been really thinking about how they can implement solutions. And two, communities are thinking about how can we get cooling centers open on extreme heat days? And having this type of data can really help them know where the best investment is to be able to open cooling centers, mostly in those neighborhoods that need it the most. So as I mentioned, uh, we also have a heat equity mapper that we've been able to build with help from many different line offices across NOAA. Uh, but what happens on this tool, which is available on our website, heat.gov, is that we take the heat data and we overlay it with a few different data sources, including the White House Climate Justice Economic Screening Tool. And so on this slide, you're able to see an example from Charleston, South Carolina, which we mapped back in 2021. So when you go to the tool, you're able to see a couple different information on this slide. So first on the left-hand side, you're able to see some of the average temperature information that was collected from this urban heat island data. And again, this, is, this data is just from one day, so it's a snapshot. Um, and so you're able to see that average temperature data. And then in the middle, you're able to see this geographic map in which you can look at its census level tracked and zoom in and be able to understand not just the temperature differences across this, but also overlaying with additional data too. On the right hand side, we do a dive into the disadvantaged versus non-disadvantaged. And so again, this is uh, what is deemed disadvantaged and non-disadvantaged is through the White House Climate Justice and Economic Screening Tool. And so for Charleston, South Carolina, it was 16% of this population that was within the mapping area that was deemed disadvantaged. But when you look further down, you're able to see that the disadvantaged tracks had on average were 0.9 degree Fahrenheit hotter than the non-disadvantaged tracks. So having this type of information can really help local communities to understand different aspects of how heat is impacting the people within those neighborhoods. And again, really making sure that we're making the investments in the areas that need it most and that we're being equitable with our solutions. And again, this is all available on heat.gov. So there's been, again, continuing with some of the outcomes from our urban heat island campaigns. Uh, back in 2021, NOAA held some climate and equity roundtables. And so this was NOAA leadership working with different communities across the country to think about how, how climate is impacting our communities and really making sure that we're understanding the equity that is happening. How can we make sure that solutions are being equitable? So there was an extreme heat component of that, and we were really starting to hear information about communities wanting more on extreme heat, wanting to take more solutions, wanting to do more work. And so as an outcome from those roundtables and pairing with our urban heat island work, we held heat tabletop scenario exercises in four cities in Miami, Florida, and Charleston, South Carolina, Phoenix, Arizona, and Las Vegas, Nevada. So at these tabletop exercises, which in the past have typically been held for things like hurricanes, tornadoes, other weather events, but there haven't really been a ton for extreme heat. So with this, we worked with local organizers at the community and brought together stakeholders from across the community. So your emergency responders, public health departments, utility sectors, community-based organizations, and so much more and got them all in a room and presented them with a heat scenario, which is something that could happen. And so we asked them questions of, okay, if this scenario happened, how would you address this? Who are all the actors that you would have to bring together? What are the different funding sources you would need? And then get to the point of what are the solutions that we can start enacting, not just now, but also in the future to be protecting our citizens. So we started doing this at the end of 2022 and just recently mapped Oklahoma City as well and we'll be mapping Philadelphia very shortly. But there's been a couple different outcomes from this as well and one of that being that we were able to take these scenarios and make sure that this is something that other communities can replicate. So on heat.gov we built together a planning document that communities can go through and understand how to put on your own heat tabletop exercise. 
But additionally, we received some money from the Inflation Reduction Act to be able to fund communities to be able to host a heat tabletop exercise. And right now that community, that that challenge is open to the public and you can go to heat.gov to learn more if you are interested in being a part of a heat tabletop exercise. So another outcome from our Urban Heat Highland campaign is understanding where communities are in their planning, in their heat governance model. So we developed a guide that is available again on heat.gov where communities can go through and understand where they are in the heat planning process. What are the different steps they need to take to get all the way to building a heat action plan and really implementing some really robust solutions? Who are the different stakeholders and actors that they need to be able to mobilize groups of people to be able to do this? So really having some robust planning documents to be able to provide as much information to communities as they need to be able to get them to the next step of heat governance, to be able to be enacting policies and solutions in their communities. Another really great outcome that we've had from these campaigns too is building a virtual reality experience of our urban and heat island mapping campaign from Washington, D.C. So we worked with a couple different line offices across NOAA, including the Office of Education, the Viz Lab, as well as Nesdis to be able to build this experience. One of the reasons that we built this is really trying to understand extreme heat to the population is something that people struggle with. And a lot of that is because people may be coming from a hotter places uh, and are just always experiencing heat, so may not understand why heat is a problem. But we know that with increasing temperatures, this is something that we have to address. So we're getting innovative. What are the different ways that we can really get people to understand heat and how can we make it fun too? So we were able to build this virtual reality experience and you can actually see an image of myself and Juan Pablo Hurtado uh, showcasing this at a event a few years ago. And so what happens is, is users will put on the virtual reality headset and fly across Washington DC and understanding why certain neighborhoods are hotter than others. So on the right hand side of the slide, uh, you're able to see what happens when you fly over the hottest neighborhood and the coolest neighborhood. And an overlaying voice will help you understand what are the different factors that go into this neighborhood being hotter or this neighborhood being cooler. And a really fun fact about this too is we were able to bring a virtual reality experience to a White House event where President Biden himself put on our headset and was able to see the White House on the event. So again, this is just a really great tool uh, that we're able to explain to, to people, and especially young people, about extreme heat and really get them to understand why this is important and how heat dis is distributed across communities. So what have we learned from all of this information? Um, from not just even the urban heat islands, but also just working with communities across in very different ways, we've learned a lot over the years that have helped shape our program and help propel us into the future too. And one of the big things being is that you can't just go, you just can't just parachute into a community. And I think that really goes back to the foundations of our program being that it's not just the, the federal government going into your community, collecting data and leaving. It's us working with lead organizers who are then training the volunteers from the community, building this network of people who are impassioned about addressing extreme heat, who are impassioned about really making sure that solutions are being implemented in their communities. And we're building that trust with the communities too, because as we're building trust with uh, these, these lead organizers and these community-based organizations who have such trust already in their community. So that's been so helpful as we're continuing to expand and grow our program. We also recognize that a lot of communities may not have the resources, the staff to be able to put on a lot of, the, in a lot of these type of programs, uh, may not have some of the data that they need to be able to showcase uh, different aspects of extreme heat. So really, it's also a listening program for us at the federal government level to understand from communities what is it that they need from us and how can we make sure that they have the resources, the guides, the data that they need. So from that, what are, what are kind of our next steps? So from the Inflation Reduction Act, we were able to fund two new heat centers of excellence. The first of them being the Center for Collaborative Heat Monitoring, which is gonna, which is gonna take on a lot of this urban heat island data. 
But we're not just looking at it at, at just the urban areas. We're also looking to map rural areas, tribal nations, territories, and so much more. So with this new center of excellence, we're really looking to gather heat data and not just the attaching the temperature sensor and driving around, but also looking at indoor air, looking at air pollution, uh, wearing wearable sensors, uh, so much more to really understand heat. And so this center is gonna be opening applications later this fall um, and really encourage any communities that are interested in learning more about the heat distribution across their city, learning how heat is impacting their citizens now and in the future to apply for the center. We also funded a second center, the Center for Heat Resilient Communities, which kind of takes it to the next step. So whether you have the heat mapping data or whether you don't, this center can really help you understand what are your next steps for solutions? What are the different policies that you could impact in your community? What are the different investments? What's the different financing that you need to be able to pull off different aspects? So to learn more about these two new centers of excellence, I encourage you to visit heat.gov to learn more. And this is my final slide, but again, just emphasizing that on heat.gov, we have all of the information that you need as it is the federal source of information for extreme heat. We have information about funding sources, about our centers of excellence, to learn more about our urban heat island program, of course, and to access all of the data, to the access the reports. But also if you're looking to understand how heat is impacting you now and in the future, we have information for reports and guides, as well as infographics and social media key messages. Everything that you need for extreme heat is there. So really encourage you to learn more on heat.gov. I appreciate you listening to this and take care.